Hi, thank you so much for joining me. In this video segment, I'm going to be focusing on the intermolecular forces between neighboring molecules. It's very important. I would say the most common mistake I see is students considering these to be bonds, and they're not. They're between discrete, separate, neighboring molecules. The first I want to talk about is London dispersion. London dispersion forces are a very, very important force, um, sometimes underestimated force, and they are temporary forces. They're caused by an instantaneous dipole. So it's a temporary shift in electron density. So if we look at this picture here, now helium can be condensed, but it's not easy because helium um, doesn't have any partial negative or partial positive or positive negative charges to attract. It relies solely on a shift in the electrons from one end of the atom to the other end of the atom, and there aren't many electrons. There's not much electron density. So for helium, this is a very, very weak force, and, set, and hence helium has a very, very low boiling point. So what happens is temporarily the electrons shift and give a partial negative charge. I wish this picture had made the, the red the negative, but they didn't, so be really careful. We show that partial with a delta. And so it's like drawing a figure eight and stopping. Now what I'll often do in London dispersion is I'll make my delta with a dotted line just to try to give some sort of image that it is a temporary force. It's there and then it's gone. It's there and then it's gone. And what happens is is that temporary shift causes this next atom to shift its electrons. So the electrons see that partial charge and they shift temporarily. So now we have a Coulombic force of attraction. Yes, you heard me right. Even though it's not a permanent positive and negative, I think it's very helpful to still talk about this as a Coulombic force of attraction and potential energy being negative for a, albeit often weak, attractive force. Okay, so because of that, this is often called an induced dipole. The random shift, so here we have hydrogen, the seemingly random shift of electron density from one end to the other induces the next atom to shift. And that's what's being shown in this. And then we can have that attraction between those partial negative and partial positive forces. Now, technically everything, I mean not technically, reality is everything has electron density. So everything has London dispersion forces. But when we are talking about network covalence or metallic or ionic bonding, it's just such a small contribution that London dispersion doesn't even come into the conversation. So the only time that you will be talking about London dispersion forces is for molecular covalent substances. Okay, so let's look at the next intermolecular force. Now, size being equal, this next force would be stronger. But don't be misled. You'll see, uh, depending on your level, that London dispersion forces can be extremely critical. Um, and dare I say, in life itself, wait till you get to biochemistry. So many cool things that happen. All right, so the next one is a permanent effect. This is from molecules that have a permanent 
uneven distribution of electron density. That would be what we call polar molecules. In this case, the chlorine has a higher electronegativity. That means on average, if we took a billion pictures and, and did little dots to depict where the electrons are spending their time, that probability, they're spending their time primarily on the chlorine. So often what we'll do for a permanent dipole is you'll draw an arrow pointing to the negative and then you make the end of the arrow a positive sign. That's called a permanent dipole moment. So if I have two HCl molecules, the reason we can get them to condense to form the liquid state is because I now have a intermolecular force of attraction between the two molecules. Positives still attract negatives. And note it's not going to be as strong as an ion when an ion has a full-on cation and anion. It's not as strong as that, but it's still a force of attraction between positives and negatives. And I want you to note it's typically depicted with a dotted line, whereas a bond, you would show the sharing of those two electrons with a solid line. For dipole moments, we show a dotted line between the two. Okay, so those are called, when it's pure, it would be called a dipole, dipole attraction. Or interaction. Okay, and note you have to have a polar molecule. So, you know, substances like um, carbon monoxide would be polar. Okay, whereas carbon dioxide has an even pull of electron density on the central atom, and so that would be a nonpolar molecule. Okay, so that's how uh, you can determine that, and that's another whole video, so I'm not going to spend much more time on that. Now, there is another intermolecular force of attraction, that attraction between neighboring molecules, and honestly, there's some research going on in this, and scientists are clarifying this a little bit. So we're going to look at it at the most foundational a level that would be appropriate for high school chemistry or college gen ed, AP, IB chemistry. And that's hydrogen bonding. Um, some people think of hydrogen bonding as just a super dipole. I don't anymore. I used to, but I, I don't find that helpful anymore. I think it's an attraction above and beyond a dipole moment. And uh, I will show you how I would assign in another video, I'll show you how I assign these intermolecular forces. But if it's molecular covalent, just briefly, I would say it's got London dispersion. And if it was polar, I would say on top of that London dispersion is a dipole-dipole. And I would write that bigger because um, within a molecule, that would be the stronger. And then I look at the molecule, and if I have an H directly bonded to an F, which frankly is simply HF, that's all you'll see. It's not a class of molecules. An H bonded to an O, which is a huge class of molecules, or an H bonded directly to an N, which is another huge class of molecules, these are capable of hydrogen bonding. It may be something of a dipole-dipole, but seems to have covalent characteristics thrown in. So then how I would depict it is if I identified a molecule such as water, I'd say, well, it has London dispersion, it has dipole-dipole because it's polar. And then I'd say on top of that, it has hydrogen bonding. And I would write that bigger because within a molecule, that would be the dominant force. That would be the dominant intermolecular force of attraction. But they're all 
present. Now, a way you can remember this is some people say, well, hydrogen bonding is fun, kind of fun, but fun. It's a little weak. F-O-N, and don't get misled. Carbon to hydrogen cannot hydrogen bond. Oh, another big mistake. I hope we can stop really early on. Only F-O-N or N-O-F on the periodic table. Okay, and what I sometimes do is this is elements 7, 8, and 9, and I tell the old elementary school joke, what is, why is 6 afraid of 7? And the answer is because 7, 8, 9. So the answer to that silly little riddle is what can hydrogen bond? Okay, now, assuming same size, you've got to be really, really careful Hydrogen bonding is the strongest of these intermolecular forces. Okay, so let's look at this one here. I'll just quickly, before we end this video, show you, and this is called an acid. This is happens to be acetic or ethanoic acid. And I want to show you how water can hydrogen bond to this. So water has, I, need, I think I need a better color for you here. So water is HOH. The hydrogens are partially positive. The oxygens are partially negative. They are not attracted at all to the hydrogens on a carbon. A CH bond is a nonpolar covalent bond. But what I can do is the hydrogen on a water can have a force of attraction to the oxygen. So that would be one point. This would be another point of hydrogen bonding. This would be a point, right? Partial positive, partial negative. That would be a point of attraction. I could have a water molecule here. You see how they sum up to make very strong attractions. So that would be the partial positive on the hydrogen to the partial negative on that oxygen. So you see we can surround these and have strong hydrogen bonding attractions between my ethanoic acid and water. Looks pretty messy now, but hopefully you got the idea while I draw, drew it. Okay, so that is a, a brief introduction to the types. And I, there's a variety of ways you can depict these, um, but I will often show them in terms of size or some sort of shading. Um, they're the positive and negative in a potential energy if you're talking about Coulomb's law. Ion, positive, negative, big. The hydrogen bonding is larger than they the permanent of dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding. And what I'll try to do for London dispersion is maybe make it shaded, or as I said earlier, maybe make it dotted because it's there and it's not, and it's there and it's not, and it's there and it's not. And this is key. I, I know we call this a hydrogen bond. If I was queen of the world, we'd call it a hydrogen force but I'm not, so don't be confused. Make sure you use its full name. Not just bond, but hydrogen bond. If you just use the word bond and you are taking a test, I know for sure in AP and IB, in my honors class, and if I was when I teach gen ed chem, I would not accept that word. I would think, for example, if you use the word bond, if you are boiling water, I want to show you why I think this is so very important. You're breaking a force of attraction between neighboring molecules. But if you use the word bond, you're communicating you're breaking that bond and making hydrogen gas and oxygen gas when you boil. I mean, that's like kaboom in your kitchen. That's not happening. You're breaking intermolecular forces between neighboring molecules, not bonds. Wow, I'll get off of that soapbox. And thanks for joining me. I appreciate your time.